think back to your time in school and try to remember how the overweight children were treated. It is possible that you were the subject of such treatment, but if not, imagine how this would feel and whether such experiences could have an indelible impact. What are the consequences of such treatment then and later in life? When people think of stigma, bias, discrimination, factors such as gender, race, and age come to mind for most people, but not necessarily weight. And weight bias is a very important topic and has been the subject of an impressive body of research. I'm Kelly Brownell, director of the World Food Policy Center at Duke University and professor of public policy at Duke. A leader in this area is Dr. Rebecca Poole, professor of human development and family studies at the University of Connecticut and the deputy director of the Rudd Center for Food Policy and Obesity. Dr. Poole is a leading voice in both research and in policy efforts aimed at reducing weight-based discrimination, stigma, and victimization. She's conducted research on weight stigma for more than 16 years and has numerous publications on the issue. She has testified in legislative hearings on weight discrimination and routinely provides expertise on strategies to reduce weight bias to national and international health organizations. She's received numerous awards for her work from national organizations. Rebecca, I give you credit for what I believe few people can claim. You really created a field. Before you began your work on weight stigma, one could count the studies on the topic on one hand, but you made this an area of legitimate scientific inquiry, and because of the work you and your colleagues have done, a robust field now exists, and much has happened. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. The subject of weight bias may seem like an academic matter, but there's a real human cost. Can you paint a picture of how people are affected by this and what sort of things actually happen in people's lives? And why don't we begin with a discussion of children? Sure. Well, most of the attention to childhood obesity typically focuses on children's physical health. But we know from considerable research that the social consequences of being teased or bullied because of weight can be really devastating for kids. And, and weight stigma begins early in life for children. Some studies have found that even by preschool, that three and five-year-olds are already endorsing negative stereotypes about their peers who have a larger body size. And by elementary school, many children are being teased and bullied about their weight. And unfortunately, this really continues throughout adolescence. And what we know is that these experiences can take multiple forms. So Weight stigma for kids means being socially excluded from their peers, um, being verbally teased or insulted because of their weight, uh, being the target of cyberbullying or physical aggression. And, you know, these experiences can really result in damaging emotional and physical health consequences for children and adolescents. Uh, we know that they have an increased risk of things like depression and anxiety, poor self-esteem, poor body image. Um, but it can also lead children and adolescents to turn to unhealthy eating behaviors too, like uh, binge eating or unhealthy weight control practices, um, avoiding physical activity, often because gym class or sports activities are settings where these kids are very vulnerable to weight-based teasing. Um, and, and we even see that teasing and bullying about weight can actually predict future weight gain. Um, and, and these can be really long-lasting consequences. Um, we published a study in, in 2017 um, from um, a longitudinal cohort called Project EAT, which essentially follows adolescents for many years. And what we found is that being teased about weight in adolescence predicted unhealthy eating behaviors and obesity and weight gain 15 years later when those adolescents were in their 30s. And and that remained true even after we accounted for their body weight and, and other kinds of demographic factors. And so, you know, we really can't ignore or underestimate the damaging impact of weight stigma on, on the quality of life for children and adolescents. Rebecca, you mentioned stereotypes that uh, are commonly uh, thought of in this area. What sort of stereotypes are there? What do people assume in the case of children, for example, is true of them just because of their being overweight? Well, you know, we see some of the same stereotypes for both children and adults. Um, assumptions that because people have a higher body weight, they must be lazy, um, lacking discipline, lacking willpower. There's also stereotypes that they're incompetent, less intelligent, sloppy. You know, the list really goes on and on. Um, kind of at the root of these stereotypes are beliefs that it's a person's fault that they're overweight or obese, that um, they have done something um, 
personally to be responsible for their weight rather than recognizing kind of more complex, broader, societal, environmental, biological factors that all play a role in, in determining a person's body weight. So that really creates a double whammy, doesn't it? That the, the person is stigmatized, their stereotypes supplied because of their weight, but then they're also blamed for it. That's pretty powerful. It's very powerful. And, and I think, um, you know, what's hard is that we live in a society that doesn't really challenge those beliefs very much. In fact, what we see from kind of the mass media, from societal messages about weight, from the diet industry, fashion industry, is that this really does come down to personal effort. When in fact, we know from considerable science that that's just not the case, that body weight is, is a very complex issue that is caused by many different factors outside of personal control. But we don't hear those messages very often. And as a result, this societal stigma, these kinds of stereotypes remain very prevalent. So I'd like to come back in a minute and address the issue of how obesity is portrayed in the media. But before we do that, let's talk about adults. So in, in what areas of life does weight-based bias and discrimination uh, affect people who suffer from weight issues? Well, certainly for adults, we see that weight bias occurs in really most societal settings and areas in life. Um, you know, there's considerable evidence of weight bias in employment settings where people who have a larger body size face weight discrimination at essentially every stage of the employment cycle from being hired um, to getting fired. And there's evidence that, that students and um, college students as well face weight bias in educational institutions. And that can be in the form of um, differential or unfair treatment from educators having lower expectations of students compared to thinner students. Um, but, you know, one of the other settings where we see a lot of um, documentation of weight bias is actually in healthcare by healthcare professionals. And uh, weight bias has been demonstrated from, you know, primary care providers, from cardiologists, nurses, dietitians, medical trainees, mental health professionals, you name it. And again, this kind of includes the same stereotypes that we just talked about, um, you know, views that patients with obesity or lazy or lacking control or to blame for their weight or non-compliant with treatment. And, and this is really concerning because weight bias from healthcare providers can really impair quality of healthcare for patients. Um, we know, for example, that um, some physicians spend less time in their appointments with patients who have a larger body size. They, they give them less education about health. Um, they're more reluctant to perform certain screenings. Um, they talk about treating patients with obesity as being a greater waste of their time than providing care to thinner patients. And we know that patients seem to be aware of these biases from providers, and, and that can really contribute to patients avoiding health care because they just they don't want to repeat those negative experiences of bias. And, and so I think, you know, this all underscores that no one is really immune to weight bias in our society, that um, you know, negative stereotypes, stigma related to weight is really present across, you know, major societal institutions of, of healthcare and employment and education, um, which means that people are really vulnerable to mistreatment in multiple domains of their life. So it sounds like the, it's the kind of thing that people are living with every day of their lives because they're intersecting with one of these systems, education, employment, medical, medical systems, almost continually all the time. And you also mentioned that the way people are portrayed in the media is a real issue here. Can you explain more about that? Absolutely. So, you know, the media is a very influential and pervasive source of weight bias. And um, our research, as well as the research of others, has, has looked at the ways that people with obesity are portrayed in the media. And what we see is it's very negative. So, for example, in entertainment media like TV shows and movies, characters who have a larger body size are consistently portrayed in ways that really reinforce negative stereotypes as being lazy or gluttonous or sloppy or the target of humor or ridicule. Um, in the news media, this, this comes across a little bit differently where we see stigmatizing visual portrayals of people with obesity. So, for example, the types of images or videos that accompany news reports about obesity are often very stigmatizing. And, and we've done some experimental studies looking at this where we show people realistic news reports about obesity accompanied with either stigmatizing or respectful positive images of people with obesity. And what we see is that 
when people see those negative stigmatizing images, it worsens their weight bias. Um, and we also find it in our research that people don't want to see those stigmatizing images. They want to see respectful, non-stigmatizing portrayals of people of diverse body sizes, but that's not what we really see in news coverage. Um, I think what's getting even more complicated with media now is we've got social media here in the mix. And we have seen evidence of, of a weight bias through things like fat shaming in Twitter and on YouTube. And it's unfortunate that social media has kind of become a platform for disparaging comments about people because of their weight. And it's, it's not just adult targeted media. I mean, these issues are also present in youth targeted media in um, children's TV shows and social media that appeals to youth. And so I think this is really a huge problem uh, because again, these media messages really reinforce and contribute to broader societal weight bias. And, and that's difficult to shut down, especially when it's happening online. And, you know, again, if we bring this back to kids, there's research that shows that the more media that youth are exposed to, the higher weight bias they have. And so, you know, the influence of weight of uh, media is really real when it comes to weight bias. Now, speaking of this, you you've seen more stories now about people challenging the weight shaming that's occurring in social media. Do you think that's helping? I do. I think even compared to ten years ago, where there was a lot of negativity, we didn't see as many people challenging or coming out and, and pointing out and bringing awareness. And I think that is changing. I think that there are some benefits of social media because um, as much as it's a platform for some of this negativity, more people are calling it out in a way that we really weren't seeing before. And, and so I think that's an important piece of progress. I think that we still need to sway, sway it so that there's more positive than negative, but it's, it's certainly a step in the right direction. Rebecca, I know there's some research suggesting that familiarity with a stigmatized group is will help reduce stigma because you know people as people and can learn more about their good qualities. And with two-thirds of American adults now overweight or obese, and the same being true for a third of American children, you'd think that almost everybody would have lots of familiarity with people who have obesity. Wouldn't this reduce bias? You know, I think that's a, a, a good assumption to make based on evidence that we've seen with other socially stigmatized groups. But you're right that um, so many people in our society now are struggling with either overweight or obesity that um, we would expect bias to be much lower than, than what it is. And in fact, we're not seeing it reduce in the same way that we've seen other reductions. And, you know, I think that's due to a couple of reasons. I think first, is that we still live in a society that um, has very strong ideals when it comes to thinness. And you know, thinness has come to symbolize values of hard work and discipline and attractiveness and desire. And unfortunately, the converse of that thinking is that people who aren't thin are, are lacking in those traits and characteristics. And those thin ideals are still heavily perpetuated um, in the media and by the diet and fashion industries. Um, so that's one of our, I think, a contributing factor. Um, you know, I think another uh, real contributor is this idea of personal responsibility that is still um, common in kind of the societal uh, thinking when it comes to body weight. And, and that notion of personal responsibility isn't getting challenged enough. And that's not to say that that personal behavior isn't important when it comes to body weight, uh, but it's only one piece of a very complex puzzle. And if we only focus on that piece, which is typically what the messaging is, um, we're not going to uh, we're not going to address it and we're not going to be able to reduce stigma. Um, I was just going to say that I think um, the other contributing factor here is is that from a policy perspective, you know, we live in a country and this is true for other countries in the world as well, where um, it's essentially legal to discriminate on the basis of weight. And we, we don't have policies prohibiting weight discrimination. And I think that really sends a message that this form of bias is, is tolerable. And so those are some main, you know, contributing factors, of, I think, to why we, we see weight stigma remain um, present and in some cases pervasive in our society. And those are kind of large areas to tackle to try to reduce it. You mentioned before, Rebecca, that weight bias and stigma can have a negative effect on an individual's mental health, including things like depression, which in turn can lead to further eating and exacerbated weight-related issues. So this really counters, doesn't it, the assumption that some people have that weight stigma is good because it puts pressure on people to lose weight. Has that pretty much been debunked now? 
Yeah, you know, there there has been this public per- misperception for quite some time that that somehow stigma will motivate people to lose weight or provide an incentive to lose weight. And I think, again, a lot of that comes from inaccurate beliefs or oversimplified notions of personal responsibility for weight. And uh, what we know is um, that when we look at the research on, on weight stigma and health, that, it, that weight stigma really does predict in a lot of longitudinal studies, weight gain and obesity over time. And there's a lot of evidence showing that weight stigma contributes to behaviors that, that promote weight gain, like binge eating or lower physical activity. Um, and some of our recent research has found that weight stigma interferes with, with weight loss maintenance, making it more difficult for people to sustain weight loss over time. And, and so, you know, yes, the evidence suggests that um, this is really contributing to um, health indices and health behaviors that promote gain in obesity. Um, and, and, you know, speaking as a psychologist, I'll add as well that the idea that shame or unfair treatment is somehow an appropriate way to incentivize weight loss is completely inappropriate. And, you know, rather than stigmatizing and shaming people as an approach to motivate improved health behaviors, we really need to provide people with support and empowerment to do that. Um, and, and I think that that's in some ways, it highlights the fact that weight stigma is both a social justice issue, but it's also a public health issue. And I think it really needs to be tackled on both of those fronts if we want to reduce this problem and, and improve people's quality of life. Um, you know, fundamentally, I think at the bottom line is that this is about respect and dignity and uh, equal treatment for, for children and adults, regardless of what their body size is. Well, Rebecca, you've done heroic work on this issue, and I know that documenting the, the extent and effects of weight bias is a big task just by itself, and I do realize that it's another task altogether to try to do something about it. Thank you so much for joining us on this one. Thanks so much for having me, Kelly. And I thank our listeners for being with us. You may subscribe to the Leading Voices in Food at Google Play, Stitcher, Radio Public, or Apple Podcast, or you can also visit our website at the Duke World Food Policy Center. This is Kelly Brownell.